Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, CIR talk series of academic year 2021 2022. And the first hybrid event we organized. It's quite challenging, uh, more difficult than what we anticipated. And it is also unfortunate that online people cannot see the uh, like in person attendees. Um, but yeah, uh, we have this event, it's a bi weekly event, and we have presenters from uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have someone visiting us from Netherlands. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Harry, our presenter today. Harry is an assistant professor at the data science group of the Institute of Computing and Information Sciences at the Radboud University in Netherlands. I actually visited Radboud uh, a couple of years ago. It's a very uh, beautiful um, kind of college and it's a beautiful town. They have a very large IR group. I mean, kind of, it's now four faculties, if I'm not mistaken, Aryan, Jorty Mistra, uh, Farva Hasidi and now Harry. So uh, if, you, if you have a chance, uh, visit Radboud, it's nice. Um, Harry's research lies on the intersection of machine learning and information retrieval. He primarily focuses on learning from user interactions and ranking, especially on the optimization part of it. Uh, he focuses on methods that correct for the effects of interaction biases. He received his PhD uh, cum laude from the University of Amsterdam under supervision of uh, Martin Berarke. And he is a recipient of the Google Research Scholar Award. And his work has won two best papers from Wisdom 21 and Cigar 21. Without further ado, I'd like to um, ask invite virtually <laughs> Harry to talk about his work on unbiased learning frame. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Hamid. Can everyone hear me properly, by the way? Is uh, everything in order? Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's, um, I think this is my first uh, hybrid talk as well. Um, so I'm, I'm glad uh, so many, many people joined up, even though I can't I see you right now. Um, yeah, I'll uh, talk today about um, unbiased learning to rank. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to talk about uh, three papers where there is a, a theme throughout the work. Uh, there, two of them are for my my thesis, which you see on screen. I'm I have a physical copy right here, of course. Um, and uh, these these are uh, policy aware unbiased learning to rank for top K rankings. A work that I did together with Professor uh, Maite de Rijker. Uh, when inverse propensity scoring does not work, a fine corrections for unbiased learning to rank, which I did together with uh, Ali Vardasby and Maite de Rijker. And then lastly, unifying online and counterfeiting to factual learning to rank, which I also did together with uh, Maarten. The reason I chose these three papers is because they uh, build upon each other. Um, as you'll see, uh, sort of the lessons and the methods from uh, the first paper come back in the in the last paper, and the same goes for the second paper. Um, so let's get started. Um, all right, I'll start with a little bit of basis. To, basis. So I assume that a lot of you have already seen uh, some counterfactual learning to rank before. The goal here is uh, to optimize a ranking model that matches uh, user preferences or relevance or what what. what however you call it, between items based on historically logged user clicks. Uh, so really the idea here is that we want to rank in order of how likely people are to click on something. We want to maximize uh, the clicks, roughly speaking. Uh, that's of course an assumption. There's of course, that may not be the best goal, but it's it's the goal that we have for this, uh, for this work. And uh, the problem here, the problem that we're tackling is that clicks are very, biased indicators of preference. With that, we mean that there's factors other than uh, relevance that influence click behavior uh, quite a lot. 
and uh, that we want to correct for because what we really want is this, this relevance or preference signal and not these, these other factors. Uh, so the existing solution here is to wait clicks to correct for position bias. So uh, you're probably familiar with position bias, but what you see here is sort of the prime example, right? This is a, an eye tracking study for people looking for a digital camera online and the different shades of area here, uh, sh uh, colors here show you how, what percentage of people looked at a certain place. And what we see is that everyone, so about 100% of people look at the top two results. But if we go down to position eight, we have about 50% of people left. So just the position where you display something has an enormous effect on how many people are going to examine an item. And that of course is also going to affect how many people are going to click there. So a priori, we can already expect a click to rate of less than 50% on this item here, this document link here, even though we, we don't know anything about that document. We don't know how relevant it is or whether it's a good match or not, just because people don't go that far down the list. So clearly this will have a big impact on the clicks that we were going to observe when we show this, this list. And um, well, the, the first step in this work is to make an assumption. This is more theoretical work. You always have to start theory with some assumptions. And we're gonna start with the most basic click model, which is the probability of a click depends on the rank or position K and the item D. So I'll, I'll use the word item instead of document to sort of denote that it's not just applicable for web search, but also other, uh, uh, other types of uh, retrieval. So we have this click probability dependent on the position and the item, and we're going to decompose it. And we're going to say it's probability of examination, how likely someone to look at, at a certain position multiplied by the probability of a click conditioned on that it's examined and the item itself. So that second part we see as the relevance or the preference. So if someone looks at something, how likely are they to click? And the first is about uh, the examination. How likely are they to examine it? And that has more to do with where you show something on screen and nothing to do with uh, the content of the item itself. This is of course a very simplified model. I don't mean to say that this is an accurate model of uh, user behavior, but this is where we start, right? We start with a very simple assumption Later in the talk, we're actually going to replace this with a more complicated model. Uh, but my argument is not that this is uh, very realistic, but even in a simple model, uh, we already have the bias problem. And that mainly comes from this uh, examination here. We're interested in the relevance part, not in the examination part. And what uh, two sort of independent lines of research about uh, five years ago realized is that uh, you can solve this, you can get your relevant signal out of a click signal by dividing by that examination probability. So if we have n displayed rankings, we, we display the ranking n times, uh, we can take the average click signal, but then each click, we can, we divide it by the examination probability. So we're going to weigh it inversely to examination probability, and that's going to converge or approximate on the relevance probability. So basically we've divided away this part here of the equation and we're left with the relevance. So if I uh, show, you know, if we have a, a, this very basic setup where there's five items being displayed, we know that 50% of people look at item uh, at the third position. And if we get a click here, we're going to weigh this click twice as much to compensate for the fact that half of the people have not examined it. And then in expectation, that's gonna give us the click to rate as if 100% of people were to look at this position. Um, so it's basically the inverse of that golden triangle that I've shown you before, uh, where we weigh by one divided by these numbers, right? So this would get a weight of one, and down here we have a weight of uh, more than two in this scenario. So, the very important part here is that we need to know these examination probabilities. And there's been uh, different lines of, of methods that uh, aim to estimate or, or learn what these uh, probabilities are, or the propensities, as they're also called. Uh, you can do it via randomization, so by swapping pairs or just randomizing the complete list. Uh, A-B testing gives you this uh, kind of data for free. 
There's also expectation maximization or the dual learning objective, which I think is a paper that's from your group, if I'm not mistaken. Um, for this talk, I'm going to assume that we know this examination probability. So it's an important part of, of getting this to work, but it's not the, the, in the scope of this talk. So I'll just assume that we know it um, and then see what we can do even if we, if we know it. All right, so far so good. That describes the situation uh, up to when I started working in this area, roughly speaking. Um, the first thing that, we, that, I, that I looked at um, was top K ranking scenario. Now, top K ranking is very prevalent in uh, especially recommendation, but also very often in search. And what we mean is that there's only K items that can be displayed, but there are more than K items in the, in the collection. So in this example here on the right, we again have five items to be ranked, but now only four items are actually examined by the user because item number five is not shown. So it's not on the, the user's screen, the user never gets to see it. We know that the probability here is going to be zero, right? There's a zero probability of examination. Now, if we think back about the example that we have, uh, the solution that we have to the position bias problem, you may realize that we run into a problem here. Namely, that's what we call item selection bias, is because the propensity is zero, we cannot reweigh clicks because there are no clicks, right? We don't have any, there's never going to be a click on position five, so we can't reweigh, right? We also can't re, we can't do uh, one divided by 0%, but we're not going to get any clicks in the first place. So we're never going to be able to uh, get an accurate estimate for item five in this case. So the existing solution can't handle the situation. And clearly the first reason is because we, we don't get any clicks here in the first place. So this is where we introduced a new uh, estimator, which we call the policy aware estimator. And the first idea is clearly we need to have some sort of randomization. We need each document to have a probability of appearing in the uh, top K. Um, but it's, it's more than just randomization. We also need the estimator to be aware of this randomization and to correct for it correctly. So I'm going to assume that the, 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 the displayed rankings, the, the rankings that we show to the user, are sampled from a stochastic policy pi. So this is a policy with some randomization. And then, similar to before, we can condition the click, but this time we're conditioning it on the policy instead of the precise position of the, of the, uh, the item. So we get a summation over all possible positions, so all k ranks or positions, we get the probability that the policy places the item at that position, the probability that the user is going to examine an item at that position, and then the probability that the user clicks on something given that they examined it. So we've before we've, we had these two parts, but we've now added this summation over k and the probability over the policy. So it's kind of the, the expectation over ranks according to the, the logging policy of being examined and then being clicked after exam. The um, policy where estimator then again uses IPS weighting, but now weights the propensity on the policy instead of the ranking. So we have the same situation. We have N displayed rankings. We take the average click signal but each click is reweighed according to this examination probability conditioned on the policy instead of the individual position. This is unbiased. As long as every item has a non-zero chance of being displayed in the top K, so it needs to have a chance of being in the top K, um, and then you, you're basically unbiased. And by unbiased, we mean if you have enough data or any expectation, you're going to uh, converge or, or be in expectation, it's going to be equal to the true relevance. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fair way to approximate it or to converge on the, on the real value. All right. So to go back to the example that I've shown before, 
Again, we have five items. Only four can be displayed at a time. But now there's two rankings that we can display. The first one here is one, two, three, four, five with 80%. The other one is one, two, three, five, four with 20%. So there's a 80% chance that we show four at the last position and a 20% chance we show five at the last position. Uh, we also have our propensities here on the left, but the, uh, the inverse propensity, what we're going to use to weight the click is based on the examination probability, which is 40% for this click on item five. But we also take into account the policy probability, which is 20%. So it's going to be 0 0.4 times the 0 0.2, which gives us a 0 0.08, 8% probability. One divided by eight is 12 and a half. So we're going to reweigh this click by 12 and a half, which compensates for both the position bias from this position, but also uh, the 20% probability of it being in the top K in the first place. All right, so that's a, that's a visualization. Uh, let me show you some results, what happens when we actually apply this. Um, now, we don't have an actual online environment where, where we can put these things in production, but luckily um, we have semi-synthetic setups that are uh, work well enough that we can get results that are, that are meaningful and that uh, usually translate into uh, actual uh, uh, improvements in, in the, the real world. Um, and the, the way to, that this is, uh, this is done is by using an existing learning training data set. So we used Yahoo Web Scope and MSLR, MSLR with 30K. Um, then we simulate sort of these displayed rankings. We generate biased clicks. And then we see if we can, uh, we can evaluate it on the original labels from which we generated these biased clicks to see if we, we managed to de-bias the results. We simulated both the setting without randomization, so not uh, so just showing the, the top K of the production ranker and with randomization where we uh, replace the last displayed item with a random uh, item that wasn't, hadn't been placed yet. And uh, let me show you some results, right? So here is the average relevant position on MSLR with 30K. The lower, the better. Uh, we varied the number of the K, so the number of display positions, the number of items that can be displayed at once. And uh, what we see down here, this dotted line is uh, the full information skyline. This is if you train a model on the actual labels. So not the biased clicks, but the, the real data. And uh, this up, line up here is the production ranker. And well, all these others are either baselines or our model. What's important here is that the policy aware uh, estimator, which is this red line, our method, always approximates sort of the best performance possible in this scenario, whereas all the other models are uh, stay away from the, the, the optimal performance, but they're also very much, some of them are very much affected by this bias, right? We see that depending on K, either performance of these lines are either very good or very bad. This is not what we want to see because it means that this item selection bias has an effect, um, whereas the red line is hardly affected by it at all. Um, here are similar results, but now, now we're talking about NHG at five. So the higher, the better. Um, the optimal model is up here. You don't really see it because the red line is, is almost overlapping it completely. Again, showing that uh, we reach the highest performance, even uh, it doesn't matter whether, we're, whether K is one or whether K is 10 or 80, et cetera. Uh, in this setting, the baselines fare better, but again, they need to be, you need to show them at least 60 documents before they can get close to optimal performance, uh, whether our method can do it regardless of, of how many you show at a time. Uh, so this is great. This is exactly what we want, right? We don't want the, the K variable to have any effect on our method. Uh, it shows that we successfully ev ev evaded sort of the or corrected for item selection bias. Um, here are the learning curves. So, so here we vary the number of trading clicks. This is on a uh, top five ranking, except for this line here. This is, uh, this is a simulation where we show all the documents at once. So there's no item selection bias. K is as big as the number of documents uh, that are there to be re-ranked. So we see that it takes longer to learn, which makes sense because instead of seeing all of the documents, you're only seeing five at a time but they're still all converging at the same point. Whereas the baselines, 
increasing the amount of data doesn't help them very much. It's a clear sign of bias, right? They're converging somewhere where they shouldn't be. Uh, so they're making a systematic error. All right, that was the first paper. So I've uh, talked about item selection bias here, shown you very quickly how existing the existing methods cannot correct for this type of bias. And then shown you that with some mild randomization and an, our policy aware estimator, you can correct for uh, this type of bias, but you should base your propensities on the logging policy instead of the individual rankings. So the, the existing method, as you remember, conditioned it on the exact position at which an item was shown, whether we're showing it, uh, we're conditioning it on the expectation of where an item is going to be shown, which is conditioning it on the logging policy, really. All right. Um, before I continue to the next part, uh, are there any questions that you would like to ask me uh, right now on, on this first part? Uh, I think there is no question in the chat. Is there any question from in-person audience? So I actually wanted to ask you, uh, um, so you, you mentioned that you don't have a realistic data set because you don't have access to um, kind of an online experimentation setup, which makes sense. Uh, but I'm wondering if the uh, model, the policy of our model, uh, seems to reach a kind of a the oracle system in terms of performance. So do you think that's because of the nature of the synthetic data or you, you believe that you can also achieve this on kind of a real? Um, it's, it's definitely, do, so it's not a surprise, right? So the, the question here in these experiments is not whether we're going to converge here because we, we've already proven theoretically that we're going to converge here. So that's that's not really so that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that you can do it in a reasonable amount of data. So I'll sh I'll show some graphs later, different experiment where there's a line that slowly goes up, but it, it's so slow that it's you can already tell like you need more queries than I don't know atoms in the universe or something like it's it's never going to happen, right? Um, so. Um, so the answer is uh, we we know from theory that we're going to converge in this in this setup. So we certainly don't want to claim that we're going to find the, the oracle the best model when we apply this in the wild. Um, yes. So, uh, but it's still the the value of these experiments is is mainly to show either that the data requirements are reasonable or the sort of the difference. So in, in plots like these, we can really show like all right. Um, this is, you know, the existing methods really have a problem here. Yeah, makes Does that sense. answer your question? Uh, do you still have any, no questions? Okay. So I, I just yeah. encourage people to uh, please be active in like engaging either here or online, ask questions. If you have an online participants can write the questions in the chat and then uh, occasionally uh, I call them to unmute and ask their questions. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Yeah. Um, so I take it as a sign that you, uh, that, that uh, everyone is, uh, uh, everything is clear so far. Um, the next part I'll, I'll talk about is uh, the, the second paper, which was about uh, trust bias. Again, this was worked to, together with uh, Ali Vardaspi and uh, Marta de Eike. And um, what we did here is um, we sort of, uh, we looked based on, uh, on other work at this assumption that we started with like this, this click model assumption, right? So, so far we had this basically, which also called a rank-based position bias. So, you know, there's an examination probability for each rank, and then that's the only real bias that we get from, from the position. But we know that, you know, actual user behavior is much more complex than that. Than that. And one of the ways it's more complex is that um, users don't treat all items at each rank similarly, even after examination. So this assumption here that once something is examined, it's just you know either clicked or not, and it just depends on the document, um, this ignores what we call the trust that users have in the ranking system. So earlier work, quite 
old work, as you can see here from 2005, already noted that users are more likely to click on items that are uh, non-relevant when they're ranked higher because they trust the search system. So for instance, if you're looking for something on your favorite search engine and um, the search engine doesn't know what you're looking for and it just puts something wrong on the first position, many people are still likely going to click that because they think, well, if the search engine put it there, and this is a really big search engine with a lot of you know, funding and, and a lot of people, smart people working on it, they must know better than, than me and they'll still click on it. So being that number one in a ranking still makes people click on it, uh, even though they might otherwise not, right? Even though it might actually just not look relevant at all. And uh, so two years ago, some uh, people from Cornell and uh, Google Research proposed modeling this as perceived relevance. So uh, the relevance as perceived by the user versus the actual relevance. And what they, uh, what they hope to find or they, they expected to find was that at higher ranks, uh, items are more likely to be, to be perceived as relevant due to this, this trust that they have in the ranking system. And the way they model it is by conditioning uh, the click probability both on the relevance and on the rank. So um, we have this epsilon plus k parameter, which is the probability that someone's going to click on an item conditioned on that it's given that it's relevant, it's examined, so the user has looked at it, and at the position at which it's displayed. And epsilon minus is the same probability, except now the item is non-relevant. So the idea here is that these two probabilities can differ per rank. So what we get is click probability at, for an item at a certain position is probability of examination, just as before. But then we have this, this uh, probability of when it's actually relevant and when it's incorrectly perceived as relevant. And the main idea here in this model is that you can vary the amount of incorrectly perceived as relevant documents per rank. So there's much, much more clicks on incorrectly at the top of the ranking than at the bottom. Um, they inferred these parameters from real world user behavior. So this was on, uh, I think on Gmail and Google Drive search. So when you're, uh, when you're typing your results, uh, when you're typing in your query, there's, a, there's an autocomplete box that shows you some uh, results beforehand. And they show five. And on that data, they try to fit the model that I showed you at the start of the presentation and the model that you that I've just introduced. And what they found is that the, the trust bias model better captures the data. It's, it's a, it gives you a higher uh, log likelihood of the data that you have. Um, and the parameters look quite different. So in, in these blue lines here are, so there's three different problems. Some of them are on Gmail, some of them are on uh, Google Drive or a different version of Gmail. I think uh, an enterprise version. And what we can see is that they drop much more quickly. So this is the examination probability than the red lines, which are the, the same settings, but now the, what the trust bias model thinks these parameters are. Um, so according to the trust bias model, users actually look at much more of the results. But then if we look at the trust bias, we see the difference. So here are the epsilon plus values and here are the epsilon minus values. So the probability of clicking when something is actually relevant up here is almost always close to one. So people do actually, if they see something relevant, they tend to click on it. That probability doesn't really go down. Like this is probably negligible. But the probability of clicking on something when it wasn't really what you're looking for drastically goes down, right? It's it's really high. There's it's a close, it's over 70% at the first position, and then it drops to about I think it's about 35 or 30% at the second position and so forth. So what this model tells us is actually, oh, people look at more of the results, but they're just less likely to click incorrectly. Um, so this is very interesting. It's a, it's a different kind of bias than uh, position bias it's, or examination bias, you might call it, something on top of it. What was interesting for us is how can we, can we get an unbiased estimator in this scenario. Um, so the first thing we did is 
introduce a notation that's a little bit more compact. So we say the probability of a click is alpha k times the probability of relevance plus a beta uh, k. So alpha here is sort of the correlation between clicks and relevance. So the more relevant something becomes how much more clicks you receive. And the beta value is kind of a base click to rate, just like how many people are going to click regardless of what you show on this position, just because they trust the ranking system. And we proved that it's actually impossible to correct for this bias with IPS estimation. This is something that they tried in, in previous work. We proved that that's never going to be uh, theoretically unbiased. The reason is that this is an affine transformation and IPS estimation, standard IPS estimation at least, assumes a linear uh, transformation. Nevertheless, uh, it's still uh, something that we can inverse. So we can actually quite easily construct an unbiased estimator as well. We call it the unbiased affine estimator. So again, the, the realization here is, okay, the probability of relevance, if this is the probability of, of a click is alpha times relevance plus beta, then the relevance is actually probability of click minus beta divided by alpha, right? It's just reversing the, uh, the formula. And this immediately gives us uh, an unbiased uh, estimator. So we can now estimate the relevance. What we do is for each click, we subtract this beta parameter. So this beta parameter gives a penalty for the number, the amount of clicks that, that are received due to trust that are sort of unwarranted. Uh, these aren't earned due to relevance, you might say. And whatever remains is then we, we uh, divide it by the alpha parameter. The alpha parameter is going to be something between zero and one. So this is actually going to multiply it by uh, some positive number. So it's reweighed just like IPS. But before we do the reweighing, we subtract a penalty from it. Um, so yeah, so it's very straightforward once you have the answer. Again, previous work tried to correct this with IPS estimation. And it's just never going to be unbiased. It's, it's basically impossible. Uh, we did more in this paper, but I want to I want to move on to the next paper due to time. Um, let's see. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm, I'll just continue, and then we can have a discussion uh, all the way at the end. Um, all right. So the final paper here um, brings these ideas together. So what we've seen so far, right? Um, what we see what we've seen in the presentation so far. But uh, at the time of the start of this work. Um, unbiased learning to rank was divided into two areas. One was called online learning to rank. So uh, these are methods that correct for bias by randomizing results through uh, online interventions. Uh, you might have, uh, depending on when you started studying IR, you might have heard of uh, dueling banded gradient descent, which used to be sort of the prime example of a method that does this, where they randomize the results and then in an online fashion get interactions during the learning process and update themselves. Accordingly, counterfactual learning to rank, what I've been talking about so far, um, was this idea of we're, we're using historical click data, click data gathered in the past. We're going to infer a model of bias, you know, these probabilities that I've been talking about, and then we're going to use that to correct the, this click data. What bothered me was that these are essentially the same problem, right? We have, we're learning from click data, we're doing optimization, the data is biased, we're going to get rid of that bias. But the results look so different. Uh, the sort of the methods that people found looked very completely different. Um, so I wanted to see whether they should actually be different, whether it makes sense to have uh, these completely independent methods here. Right. The first step was actually to combine um, the earlier work that we did in counterfactual learning to rank. So I just presented you with three forms of bias, right? Position bias, item selection bias, and trust bias, and three solutions to them. So uh, the existing inverse propensity scoring, um, which is now already uh, five years old, then uh, the policy wear propensities with some randomization, we can correct for item selection bias and position bias at the same time. We also looked at these trust bias and we found these affine transformations, which correct for trust bias and position bias at the same time. 
but we didn't have anything that corrected for all three of them at once. So that was the first step. And we're going to call this the intervention oblivious estimator. The name will make sense later in the, in the presentation. Um, the starting assumption here is again, we have this affine click model where we have the alpha and the beta instead of just a examination probability. But this time uh, we, we learn from, we take the trick from that first paper, the top K paper, where we condition the click probability on the logging policy, right? So instead of basing it on the individual position, we can also condition it on the logging policy. And now we get this, again, we get this uh, expectation over K based on the policy. And it actually turns into the expected alpha value under the logging policy multiplied by uh, the probability of relevance plus the expected beta value of that item under the policy. And uh, similar to what we saw in the in the trust bias paper, uh, you can very easily inverse an affine transformation. And this is what we call the intervention oblivious estimator. So it's combining the, the, the tricks basically from the previous two papers to create an estimator that corrects for um, both, uh, both position bias, item selection bias, and trust bias. Okay, it still doesn't do anything with online learning to rank, but it's it's just to uh, get a counterfactual learning to rank up to speed, right? We can now correct for all these biases. Um, however, um, if we when we apply this online, something strange happens. So I have an example here um, where there's two models deployed for an equal amount of time. So we have model one and we have model two uh, uh, logging policies, uh, I should say two logging policies uh, collecting data for two equal amounts of time. And uh, in this example, all the beta values are zero. I have two items, but the alpha uh, values differ. So the expected alpha under logging policy one is 0 0.1. The expected alpha for item two under logging policy one is 0 0.5. So if we apply the uh, the estimator I just introduced, the intervention oblivious estimator, it's going to give item one a weight of 10, one divided by 0 0.1, right? Item two, a weight of two, again, one divided by 0 0.5, but this only applies to the clicks for the first time period. So only those gathered during the first time period when po logging policy one was active. For logging policy two, Still, all the betas are zero, but now both items have a uh, expected alpha value of 0 0.5. So both of them get a weight of two, but only during the second period of time. So when we have a click gathered in the second period of time, we're going to weigh that click by two. If it's gathered during the first period of time, we're going to weigh that click by either 10 or two, depending which document it is. Now, this is unbiased, right? If you if you run this, if we if we have these periods for a long uh, enough amount of time, it's going to converge on the actual relevances, like what, what we're really interested in. But what's weird and what, what's sort of uh, counterintuitive is that over here, we treat both, both of the items exactly the same, even though we know that during the first period of time, we gave item two, a really big advantage, right? Like it had, a, it was much more likely to be that the clicks were correlated with relevance than item one. But we've completely forgotten how we treated item one during the first period when we're working with clicks during the second period. So this seems very strange. Why do we give the same click on the same document these different weights depending on when they were logged? And we wanted to see what, what happens when we, ch when we change that, what happens if we take into account that that intervention, that change in logging policy took place. So we started by uh, defining this pi set, where, which contains all the logging policies for each time step. So we have a really big set. It contains all the logging policies that were used during the gathering of data. This is different than what's usually assumed in counterfactual learning to rank, because we usually assume there's just one logging policy. But if we see an intervention as a change in the logging policy. So it makes sense to now keep track of what all the logging policies were. Then I'm again using the same trick that I used in the first paper 
we're now conditioning the click probability on the set instead of the individual um, logging policy. So we have the click probability of a click on an item under this logging policy is now going to be an average over the logging policies. So one divided by the, the set size, again, a summation over all the policies in the set. And then the what we saw before, the probability conditioned on the logging policy. So this part is how likely is this item to be clicked under the logging policy? And then this is the expectation over logging policies, right? It's the same trick, but now on the scale of the set of policies instead of a single policy. This turns again into an expectation, right? We have the expectation of alpha, but now under the set times the relevance plus the expectation of beta under the set, specific to the item, of course. You probably see it coming. This is again some a, a, a formula that you, we can we can do the inverse of. We can inverse this transformation. So the probability of relevance is actually just the probability of a click minus this expected beta value divided by this expected alpha value. This is exactly the same as what I've shown you before. We just changed what we're conditioning it on. So it's a very straightforward extension, the same idea, um, but it turns out that it works really, really well. So let's go back to this example, right? We have these two logging policies that were active for the same amount of time uh, in sequence. The difference is because we're conditioning uh, our estimator on the set of policies, we don't have two separate weights for these two different time periods. We have one weight for per item for all of the policies. So policy one gets this probability, which is uh, uh, um, one divided by the expectation of uh, uh, alpha under this logging policy, that's just going to be, in this case, it's going to be uh, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5 is 0 0.6. We have two policies divided by two, you know, we get uh, one divided by three, right? Uh, so it's going to be three plus one third. So uh, the second one is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So this is just going to be the weight of two, right? It's uh, the alpha value doesn't change when the policy changes. So, um, on the one hand, you know, this is more elegant. We have one weight instead of four weights, uh, as in the previous example, or sorry, we have two weights instead of four weights. So one weight per item. But what's, re what's sort of the important observation here is that this value here, three plus one third, is much lower than the, the maximum value that we got here, 10. And uh, we know from IPS weighing that uh, the lower these values are, the sort of the maximum values uh, are, the less variance we can expect. Another way to visualize this is um, here we have uh, 500 time steps, and the blue line here represents how alpha changes as the logging policy changes. So at 100, the alpha value drops, so there's a much lower correlation in clicks and relevance. This means an item is probably much lower on the, on the ranking. And um, on the right, we see sort of the one divided by uh, that alpha value, which would which would go from, uh, I think it's four all the way up to 20 here. And uh, this is what the, the existing methods would do, the, the intervention oblivious estimator. But if we take, if we condition um, our alpha on the set of logging policies, so that, that's the set of logging policies so far. So for instance, here at 200, it's conditioned on all the logging policies, including up to and including policy 200. We can see it's a much smoother line that descends much more slowly, but the inverse weight remains much lower. So we don't have these really high weights, which really reduces variance, but we're still unbiased. All right, let me show you what that looks when we go back to a simulated setting. So um, here we have results on the Yahoo uh, setup. It's similar to before, but this time we have uh, a top five click model. It's the affine click model that I showed you before. If you remember those graphs that I showed you, um, we sort of took the average values, roughly the average values, we had to eyeball them, but um, roughly the average values that, that were displayed there. Uh, so these are supposedly values that are actually based on real user behavior. It's sort of the best we can do to approximate uh, that setting from, from the uh, paper by Google. 
and we did both counterfactual and online experiments. Interventions here are spread on a logarithmic scale. I'll, I'll walk you through it. So this is the counterfactual setting. So there's no interventions here. And we have uh, our three different estimators. So in this setting, intervention oblivious and intervention aware are equivalent because there are no interventions, right? Again, uh, the logging policy performance is somewhere over here. I, I haven't displayed it, but the optimal policy is up here. So this is sort of our oracle that we want to reach. Uh, this goes back to uh, Hamid's question, question from earlier, because in this setting, we can actually see that we can't really get an optimal result even after 100 million queries, right? 100 million uh, queries with, uh, that were issued um, so it shows that this is really difficult and we really, really, really large amounts of data to even get close to that optimal model. Uh, we don't observe it, right? I haven't run the simulation for, for long enough to see when it gets there. Uh, but what's important here is that it's better than the existing estimators, which is also no surprise because it's the only one that's unbiased here. Uh, you can clearly see, for instance, the affine model converges very quickly, uh, very bad level of performance. All right, then we also did the same setting, but now we allowed for 50 interventions. So these are spread on a logarithmic scale. So one of them was, like at a, for instance, a thousand, one at 10,000, 100,000, a million, etc. So exponentially spread. And uh, all the performances drastically go up. So the online interventions really, really help. But what's important here is that the red line, so our intervention aware estimator, gets the highest performance with very little variance, whereas the intervention oblivious estimator, so this was almost the same estimator, right? The only difference was that we were conditioning on the individual policies and not the set of policies, right? That was the only difference. It has lower average performance. Uh, so this is an, an average over 20 runs. You see here the 90% interval it's really wide, right? Like at some places it gets the worst performance and also the best performance in its 90% interval. So the variance is enormous. What we can learn here is that interventions help on average, but if you don't actually take their effect into account, it can do more harm than good. You could be introducing so much variance that you're actually better off not doing the, uh, the interventions at all, at least in terms of, uh, uh, if you take into account variance, right? On average, it's better, but you still have that 90% uncertainty. All right, so, um, yeah, but what's really important here is that we the intervention aware estimator gets a very good performance. We now reach the Oracle performance, right? And uh, after about a million issued queries, which looks like a very doable number uh, with very low variance. So uh, in terms of, uh, making the counterfactual learning to rank online, this really seems to work very well. Um, we also looked at the effect of interventions. So here's the logging policy in SCG. So here you can see when we did these interventions. So the blue line is one intervention, which you can see is in the middle of the logarithmic scale. Uh, the other ones you see here, every time the line moves, an intervention has taken place. The trend is the more interventions you do with the intervention aware estimator, the higher your performance is, but there is diminishing returns. Uh, you don't get, like you get a really high jump from going from one to five, but you don't get so much of a jump from going from five to 50. All right, the other question then becomes, what if we take these online learning trend methods, which I, I haven't talked about so far, and we turn them into uh, either counterfactual methods or what if we compare them with our new uh, counterfactual online intervention aware estimator. We did the online experiment, which I'm showing you here. We compared these online methods with, um, uh, which are with our new method, which is both counterfactual and not online learning to rank. And initially, uh, the pairwise differential gradient descent baseline has a higher performance when the when you have very few amounts of queries, but very quickly their performance is completely comparable. We don't have any meaningful differences here. Um, so we, it seems that we can really get state-of-the-art online performance with the exception when you have very little data. 
But then, yeah, when you have such little data, it's usually not when you want to use these methods in the first place. The opposite question, can you take an online method and turn it counterfactual, um, is also something we looked at with the idea of seeing, um, you know, if the counterfactual methods can work online, maybe the opposite is also true. Um, the answer here is a little complicated. Um, this yellow line is pairwise differential gradient descent with 100 interventions. Uh, that's the same amount of intervention that we gave the intervention aware estimator in this previous plot. It gets very good performance, but then performance starts to drop after a while. So this indicates that this is biased, right? It's not going to converge on what we really want, but it's kind of misleading in the sense that on the way there, we do get very close to Oracle performance. Um, what's important to understand here is that we don't actually um, know how to do any sort of early stopping here in, in a, uh, with any theoretical guarantees. So the whole point of this method is that you keep it running forever. Uh, but now we have a method where if you gather more data, performance can drop. So this is really unreliable. Um, so even though it does get really good performance, it seems to be a very unreliable choice. Um, so what we uh, conclude from that is basically that um, even though you, you might get the higher performance, theoretically speaking, in, in terms of reliability, uh, the counterfactual methods seem to be the, the, the better choice here still. All right, so to conclude, um, I've shown you uh, a new estimator that's both counterfactual and online. It's the most reliable choice for counterfactual learning to rank, and it also reaches uh, online performance comparable to state-of-the-art. Um, this existing method, pairwise difference building percent, is not reliable when you don't apply it fully online, which is something that wasn't known yet. And this was kind of the first time we had a method that was the best for both online and for counterfactual learning to rank, which I yeah, personally found very exciting. Um, yeah, so I've shown you these three uh, papers. Um, you've seen sort of the tricks from, or the, the techniques from the first two papers came back in the third paper, uh, bringing them sort of all together. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to take your, your questions. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, is there any question from here? Okay, first question from Bruce. Hi, Harry, good talk. This is Bruce Croft. Um, but I really just, just a couple of clarifications to help mm -hmm. me summarize the whole thing. So what's the short definition of an intervention again for me? Right, In intervention, uh, we define it as uh, whenever you change the logging policy. So the policy that from which you sample rankings to show, if there's a change, one time step is different than the other, the next time step, that's an intervention. Okay, and so in your experiments, what did, when you change to an online environment, what is your definition of an online environment? Ah, yeah, I, f I forgot to, to mention this. What we do is we, uh, we replace the logging policy with, at, at certain moments, with the policy that um, we think is the, the so far we've optimized. So it seems to be the best policy so far. Um, so it's kind of like you take the logging policy, you replace it with what you think is best right now. It's pure exploitation. Okay. And finally, um, what, your methods uh, made these assumptions about top K, um, a top mm -hmm. K environment. So how much of a impact is that on all your results? I mean, whether the K is, you gave an example of, small k i forget whether you had graphs that showed if you were interested in k of a thousand or something like that all right yes so um for this last paper we just looked at the top five so um uh these graphs here were this there's a, this is a top five environment but i have uh let's see the graphs from the earlier times okay i thought i could quickly get there uh, but from the first paper, they, we did very, uh, very decay. Uh, yeah. it, it, in, in short, I just wanted to know what's the general impact of, of the assumption of top K, whether, you know, when you're on your results. 
Yeah, so on, on the methods that we have, uh, so for instance here, this is one where we very K, um, they all converge, near, they're still in by, so they still converge to the right place. We did see that it takes longer to learn. So this is the difference between learning K5, and I think this is K136 or something. That's, I think, the maximum length that we have in, in this data set. Um, so you see the order of magnitude here is 10 times, 10 times slower. Which okay. makes sense because we, you know, you go from 136 to five, which is a really big difference. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. That that helps. Okay. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Alex, is there any question in the chat? No. Okay. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so I'll I'd like to ask a question. So, mm -hmm. um, here in the in the last work. We assume that the uh, logging policy changes, right? But uh, this is not the only thing that changes over time. User behavior also changes as the logging policy change. Uh, mm -hmm. The types of information needs also changes uh, as the time change, for example, I don't know. And Black Friday, the type of queries people search is very different than the other days. Mm -hmm. So is this kind of, so I, I've, I feel like you, your methods assume that they don't change the user behavior and also the type of information needs don't change. And if so, uh, what's your comment on this? How, how we can kind of incorporate? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, so we uh, we assume that there's just one relevance per item, and it's the same throughout the logging procedure, and it's going to be the same when we deploy uh, the model. Um, there is work uh, by uh, my former colleague uh, Wolf Jagerman. It's uh, the title starts with when people change their mind. If you search for that uh, and you search for Marco de Eyck or Olf Jagerman, you'll, you'll find this work. Uh, they also, they allow for these relevances to, to slowly change over time. If they slowly change, there are, there are things you can do. And uh, basically what they do is, um, I think their solution is uh, to have sort of a running average that, that puts more importance on the most recent clicks versus the later clicks. So you still use everything to learn, but the, it assumes, okay, these, these last few clicks are going to be more representative of uh, the situation right now. And if the changes aren't too abrupt, that works. You mentioned Black Friday. This is not going to prepare you for Black Friday, right? Like you, yeah, this, uh, that's such a unique moment. Uh, it, I don't think you can see that coming in, in the data, right? It's, it's too sudden. But for gradual changes, it's going to work. I think um, in practice, this is usually applied uh, to data, let's say every week or every two weeks on the previous, if you have a really high throughput, if you have a lot of interactions, uh, this is something that I hear being done in places. So every two weeks, the difference is probably not that great. Um, but yeah, there are definitely situations where you're going to run into that or, or where it's not going to, uh, uh, things are going to change too urgently. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any last questions? Okay, you are right at time. Again, thanks, Sai, for, for the nice presentation. And please join the other Zoom link for, for the meeting. Uh, we'll join shortly. And thanks again for everyone for joining us, either in person or remotely.